This is The Water Table. A chance to hear the agricultural side of these issues. A place for people to go find information and education. Water management is just going to become even more critical into the future. How misunderstood what we do is. I would encourage people to open their minds and listen to this dialogue. Well, welcome to the Water Table Podcast. I have the pleasure today, I'm at the Iowa Laika Farm, um, and I ran into Mr. Merv Hillpiper. And uh, Merv's kind of a legend around these areas. Um, Merv, you're gonna be 89 years old, is that right here pretty quick? I'm gonna be 89, yeah. Yeah, a few days. Yeah, really, um, we don't really judge a guy how old he is, it's how many years he's got left. Well. <laughs> it's probably infinity for you, right? I don't know. Yeah. I don't know. Well, wanted to just talk to you about your life and your career a little bit. Um, been an auctioneer, um, kind of a uh, American renowned auctioneer. You've been involved in the National Auctioneers Association for years and years and uh, done equipment auctions for 65 plus years. Is that right? Well, uh, our family has been, the Hillpiper name, has been in the auction world since uh, for 110 years. It was 1914, my dad sold the first auction. And uh, I guess uh, I left uh, the high school. I was, I've been, the story of my life seems to be nothing but auctions. But yeah, we've been around a long, long time, yeah. as well as in the tiling business. Yeah. I think our family, my brother's name, and we've been around in the Thailand business since, I guess, 43. But I personally have been involved in auctioneering for 83 years. 83 years. Started when I was five, started training. Sold yeah. auctions. We've done, have done over 5,000 auctions. We've sold auctions in every state in America, Canada. And I think in the Thailand world, we've sold every machine. There's not one model of machine we haven't sold. Really? And uh, we sold, uh, I had the honor of selling the uh, kilns, the lead kilns or, or clay kilns. Yeah. And uh, up at uh, Rockford, I believe they were. But uh, we've had the honor of, uh, I was, uh, I think I was in my sophomore or junior or senior year. My brother had gotten out of the war and he come back. And uh, we bought a uh, ratchet type plow from, uh, uh, the boys down and we, we had a Pella ratchet and we gave uh, I think uh, $800 for it and then I graduated and uh, it was a little Vermeer and my brother paid me back uh, that my 400 investment but the name Hill Piper is still in the tiling business yeah. so I've been around the tiling off from the hook and the crown shovel for about all my life along with the world auctioneering yeah yeah so you you were in, you got out on some jobs when you were a young kid, and well, you it, really learned how to work doing that. Well, kind of work. yeah, with uh, my folks were divorced, and I uh, I was I thought I was either five or nine, and we moved to Goldfield, and I uh, I went out. And I, the name Hillpiper is nothing but we're working people. We're old French people. There's never I don't think there's a lazy Hillpiper in the world. I haven't met one. There's a lot of lazy French people. There are a lot out. of French people, but that's because they drank the wrong, wrong wine. They drank that old wine, they, not well, whatever. But I went on and got a job at the, at the uh, veterinarian when I was about five, six years old, whatever, for $2 a week. And then I mopped the floor down at the hatchery for a nickel and up at the uh, pool hall. And then, the, you know, the war was coming over with, and... Uh, they were shipping German prisoners back, and in town of Goldfield, that railroad track run right kind of the edge of town. Where we lived in a little house with my grandmother, and they would uh, the German prisoners. Yeah, that old train, of, ooh, ooh, and you'd pull up the shoe, and the doors would swing, and people would come out, and the the people were running from town to town looking for something to eat. But then they would bring the German prisoners through because they all had farms and had the cattle the stockade there, which they would run the cattle on the trains. Well, when they had the cattle, they'd let the prisoners out and exercise. And I remember then, and I, my mother always said, you take care and help people. So I had a nickel, and I remember very plain. I went and brought a stamp and an envelope 
So that German printers could write a letter back home. So we've been involved, I've been involved with the public. Tylers, these tiling people, to me, are some of the greatest engineers in the world and the house movers. But the tiling industry, I have been involved with it practically from ever. My nephew is still in the tiling game. So did you have any older brothers? I had three brothers. Uh, well, one was in the army, they, he's gone. And my other brother, he's gone. And my brother that was in the Thailand, he's gone. And the nephew is still Thailand, but I'm... You didn't, it, you didn't have any brothers that fought in World War II, did you? Well, I don't know, came out of it in 43, so. Okay. But, uh, and I went in, I was in in Korea. Yeah. Uh, but uh, the world of auctioneering, there's a, a whole book. I sold three auction a week in the army. Uh, they were wondering how was that? It, but uh, I, they put me in to be a cook. Well, I cooked three days on and four days off. So in the four days, I went out in Nob Hill and got on the microphone there. And, and oh, yeah, it's been a very interesting. A lot of it worked for the Jewish boys and learned a lot. But uh, in the world of, of auctioneering, 50 times I competed in the world championships. Yeah. And finally, in 2004, on my 50th try, I finally was awarded the gold medal for the world. Really? So it's been Where a was that at? That was at Madison, Wisconsin, 2004. Yeah. yeah. Right as of today, if there's a Guinness World Record, I could probably hold it. Yeah. I have been in 65 world championships. Wow. But it doesn't make me any better or any worse, but it's but been a lot of fun. But you weren't there last week, I heard. No, yeah. no, that, no, I wasn't in the Nationals last week. I haven't been to the National now for a couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. But so I what, can, was your, what was your... Uh, Tell me about the biggest auction you ever conducted. Well, I don't really remember the biggest. I've sold a lots of auctions. I know John some Deere. Awful big farm. Awful big sales. Big, yes, uh, big sales. sales. In 1966, I conducted 74 auctions. I think 71 auctions, 74 days. I used to do a lot of work for John Deere. Back in those days, when the machinery dealers were closing up shops, John Deere, I had a lot of dealership auctions. And there were signs back in the 80s that I recall they called me at the Moline and uh, he said, I want you to look and their, and their parking lots are full of new machinery. Absolutely full. I don't know how we're going to get rid of them. And then John Deere would, we would take a 40,000 uh, 40, pound load of drill bits and stuff and we we went to Minnesota, rented a place. We had we, a lot of places we'd rent and we'd have those drill bits sorted a hundred to a lot and we sell drill bits. John Deere, I know for fact, I know for fact that nobody, no other auctioneer was ever allowed to sell new machinery without a dealer. But and I can't tell you the name of the town in Iowa, but we're selling a dealer out and I had a Palomino mare and she'd had a colt. And I put a little speaker on the back of that saddle and rode down through that machinery and sold the machinery. Really? And then we went to, to the John Deere plant and sold machinery. Well, now you photograph it. But they had a uh, cart that people could ride on, and I sat at the front of that cart, and they drove to the plant with sold machinery. So John Deere has been very, very close, very close. The first really convention they had yeah, any years ago at Waterloo, we, uh, we held that in our place. I had six different countries staying with me. Really? But John Deere has been very, very, oh, years ago, those block men, they were, they had me everywhere. And uh, the knowledge, we'd line up 80 to 100 tractors, and we'd walk down them tractors, he'd say, now I got 800 in this time. And I could remember every solitary tractor, what they had in it. And then days, we'd get thousands of people at the auctions. Yeah, yeah. And I never, I never started an auction unless I shook hands with every man there. Really? And we did, we did, I guess, the right thing in those days, and I, Cannot explain why our business ex just exploded. I went and bought uh, five sets of tuxedos, and we never started an auction without a tuxedo. It didn't make any difference. We were selling a herd of Holstein cows. We'd ship them, and we had them uh, all chipped up. But when we started the auction, we had a tux on. When we started a machinery auction, we had tux on. So we made that image of professionalism, yeah. and so it has stuck with me all the way. Tell me, do you... Would you have a favorite item you ever sold? If you could pick one item that you ever sold that's something that stuck with you that was unique or? Well, 
in California, we did uh, we did a thousand uh, caterpillars, and that was right when uh, faxes were coming in. Yeah. And I had a car that was a Queen Mary, one of the queens of England. It was one of her special cars. That meant a lot. But in uh, Craig was eight years old at the time. We had a six day sale, and we had Lindbergh's engine, Duesenberg's, and Craig sold that at eight. So. A lot of those memories. The the uh, Pennsylvania Railroad called, and I went out and looked at all of their items. I, but I tell you, there's been so many unique things, so many. Yeah, uh, yeah. And I had a chance to, uh, Ralph Wade, uh, probably, the, in my opinion, the greatest auctioneers of all times. One of the greatest, most wonderful. But there's, you know, in the world of auctioneering, you have bid callers and then you have auctioneers. So, but Ralph's are true bid, uh, true auctioneers. So somebody made a a bow, a doll replica of, of Ralph, and I bought that doll, the first one, for four thousand dollars. And I gave and the money had to go to St. Jude. So that particular yeah. visit to St. Jude, I never forgot those kids at St. Jude. And I think today, the National Auctioneers has raised millions and millions of dollars for St. Jude. So there's a lot of memories, but I'll tell you what, I made a statement one day and the guy said, I'll prove it. Yeah, I said, you know, you give me a pile of cow manure and a couple of cows and we're gonna have an auction. So he called me down to Kansas City and he had a herd of longhorns and we set some chairs up. We sent 16 chairs out in the cow yard and we drove the cow, the, the longhorns, we drove them out and shut the gate. And the people came and sat on the chairs, and we had an auction. And I don't know how many million was sitting on the chairs. And then we went to Greeley, Colorado, and did another same thing. Yeah, we've had so many, yeah, but there's nothing so wonderful. And it's an art. Yeah, there's yep. a lot of people can say they're an auctioneer, but whatever. But so, I'm so honored. So one other thing that I bet a lot of people don't know about you is that you uh, you got into the sled dog business. Yes. Can you tell well, us about how much that time you got here? Well, not a lot, but not tell a us about that. Well, I'll go to the facts real quick. Yeah. We were very busy in the oxen business. My wife said, I think you need to get a break. So I got on a plane, flew in, and flew up in Minnesota, went fishing. When I was up there fishing, I saw these little, these little, uh, little things. Well, I said they were moose turds. And so I said, well, we'll come back and hunt moose. So we came back that winter and hunt moose, and all of a sudden, by golly, uh, there was a bear. Well, we got a black bear in, in there. So, anyway, uh, so uh, I had that black bear, and, and the guys at Parkersburg had just come back from polar bear hunting, and I said, "Well, where did, you, where did you? If you want to go polar bear hunt, you better go quick." So I called, got a uh, booking, flew to Alaska to polar bear hunt, and we went off to the coast of Siberia. It's a long bat, you take it real quick. So we went out on the ocean. And I ended up uh, getting a polar bear, and I had to have it, uh, we had to have, we skinned it, brought it back, and the Eskimos then had to, to flush it. And they were gonna take it down to the ocean the next day and flush it. Well, as there, there's uh, some dogs laying out there. And I said, well, now when you come down to get me in the morning, you bring that dog team. So here he come with seven dogs, and that was the day I got sick. Uh, so we took the hide, and I stood in there, I sat in that sled, and I said, oh my gosh. Well, I ended up buying a dog team to make a long, long story work. I ended up in the top three of the world, and uh, I was over 500 races. And if you gotta go quick, I'll tell you the final analysis. Last year, Anchorage, Alaska, invited me back to the Hall of Fame and played a great honor. I was in the movie, Spirit of the Wind, and that was the movie about my good friend, George Atla. But I had a chance to go back to Anchorage, and I set the world record on that uh, hill called Cardova. That particular day, all of Alaska and America was in the race. Dogs from the top dogs of the world. Really? And the first day I went out with 12 dogs, ended up third that day. The next day I went out with 10, ended up third. And the last day I did what no man had ever done, I ran the race with five dogs and still ended up third in the world. So it's been a real thrill. Yeah. Yeah, I was in over 500 sure. races. Well, I'll tell you what, you might have French heritage, but you're Iowa-born and American-made. So. Well, we appreciate it. Des Moines Racer, 
printed some awful big stories, and we appreciate it. I think they said Iowa loves the Hill Piper. So yeah. we well, love that. And uh, to you people in Presco, you guys have all been part of my life. I can tell you that we could tell stories upon stories with the sales with your, your wife and my oh my at the LICA convention. Your wife had just gotten out of Oxford school and I had her help. And then the day she called and wanted to be a world champion. It took me five years, you know that, a long yeah. time. But your wife ended up being one of the top auctioneers of the world. So yeah. proud of her. And she's yeah. known all over the world, China, everywhere. Yeah. So it's been a real wild ride. I'm real grateful. God has been so good. My memory, most guys my age can't remember if they built a belt on or pants or where are they. Yeah. My memory is so rock solid. I don't know what I'm doing, but doctors, they tell me, what do you eat and what do you take? But I really take care of myself. Yeah. Thank you well, for Well, Merv, the- thanks for joining us on the Water Table Podcast. Well, I'm all proud of these, these Tylers. Thank yeah. you. Well, thanks for listening to this episode. I have so much fun uh, recording these. I hope you have as much fun listening as I do recording. These episodes are available on all major podcast platforms as well as YouTube. So find them and download them when you can. Thanks for joining us.